What the crap is everybody so upset with this Animaniacs reboot for? Oh yeah, everything. Hello everyone! Why is my cord in the way? No, my cord's in the way. I am Mecha Random 42, the one, the only, the original, your favorite YouTube consumer advocate, Harpy. Before I recorded this video, we are in the middle of a live stream. So before I started recording, I have been trying to stall, trying to avoid, because I, I kind of think that pretty much everybody under the sun, everybody on the planet is going to have some issue with something I say in this review. So, either unsubscribe to me now or... Please like the video if you liked it. If you didn't like it, keep your comments to yourself. Yeah, oh, maybe maybe the less snotty way of, uh, yeah, if you do like this stuff, definitely subscribe. It'll probably be shadow banned anyway because it's under that little weird category that even though it is a show that is animated and kind of designed and I, I guess you would say it's supposed to be for young people. It's really not. The audience base in this is everybody pretty much over 30 who watched the original. People like me. I was watching it a little too late, but that's because I found the Animaniacs had the subtle... Why, why do I say late? Because I've been watching it nonstop for the past 20 some odd years pretty much. That was the show. That was one of my favorite shows. Animaniacs and Pinky the Brain were kind of... I like them more than Star Trek. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> These, this is where I get a lot of my humor. This is where I get a lot of my personality and my kind of ability to separate what's funny from what people might take way too seriously. I've watched two episodes of the Animaniacs reboot on Hulu and I have some... Th oh, I took notes. I took notes. My big, my big first note was what the crap is everyone so upset with for this Animaniac reboot? Everything. They're upset with everything. Everybody is going to find something to be upset with. First off, there's some line reads in the very, very opening title. And my first note was, woke opening. Woke opening. There's a woke opening right there. Woke opening. They changed a couple of lines in the opening as they do normally, as they do normally. This kind of sums up everything, every, everything that I was saying earlier today before I started reviewing it. And I saw this before, is this the one? Right there in the opening. Gender balance, pronoun neutral and ethnically diverse. Animaniacs is making neckbeard, neckbeard Twitter's heads explode with this lyric change. Well, well, if you really, really think that, if you really, really have this malicious, we have to get back at those horrible, toxic, those toxic, racist, re horrible white men, old oh, white dudes, re re re. If you really, really have that mindset when you're watching this, then you're a horrible, sad, pathetic, miserable excuse of a human being because I watched the line read. I thought it was funny. Gender balance, pronoun neutral, and ethnically diverse. Gender balance, pronoun, pronoun neutral, and ethnically diverse. Let's, let's actually look at this. Let's actually look at this. <laughs> that looks like it's making fun of it to me. That looks like it's kind of mocking the outraged snowflake culture to me. That's what it looks like to me. I thought it was a poke at SJWs. I did too. I thought it was a poke at SJWs as well because that's what they do. They take the most ridiculous things in pop culture and they poke fun at it. And if you really, really, really think that is a dig at, at quote unquote neckbeard Twitter people, then you missed the joke. It went right over your head. It went right over your head and, you know, right past your little gender studies degree that you, that you can't get a job with. So now you're this little out of work barista who has to re and cry and wear that you want a free allowance from mommy and daddy and the government. <laughs> Oh, we're not done with you people yet. We're not done with you people just yet. Is it woke? I don't think so. I don't think it's really, really woke. And in the places where it does actually try and have a serious pro-feminism sort of message, it falls really, really, really flat. And I don't think they're going to be doing that for that much longer. That's just episode two, though. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. I took some notes. I did take some notes. So so our first, I've already broken down the trailer and I'm going to recap a little bit of what I said about the trailer, which is pretty much the entire first opening 
um, act, the, the first cartoon, which is the Warners. They're coming into modern day times after being gone for 20 years. Yakko Warner eats an iPad and he knows everything from the last 20 years that happened. You get a lot of really, really funny, spot on, hitting every single note of, of the craziness that's been going on. And they even, they even mention how they they wrote this in 2018 and are trying to be current. They're very self-aware. They poke fun at themselves. They poke fun at reboots. They poke fun at a lot of this modern day culture. They even poke fun at the orange man and they poke fun at orange man bad jokes not being funny in a way that's way fun. Like their orange man bad jokes are so much more funny than anything else. That'd be like something that I would write if I were writing a joke. And I just hope that in a couple of years, whenever they get around to it, we'll get a joke about Mumbly Joe as well. True international depression. This is exactly the type of show that would be making a joke about something adult and grown up, like a, a minor little thing in the political, just a minor little thing. Because yes, they're going to reference some of the crazy, dumb, ridiculous crap, right? One of the one of the lines that they got really, really mad for, the first look, it was the first look thing that I already broke down a lot, where they're like, oh, this is our first word back. Let's make it really, really important and good. And they already blow it. Both of the Warner guys blow it. So they keep trying to silence Dot to make sure her opening line is really, really good. And then they bring back that joke again with Ralph the Guard. And it's a really funny gag when they finally get his opening line because they're like, oh, it's perfect. And I'm not going to spoil it for you because it's really funny. I really, really enjoyed this. I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, the first episode, particularly the first episode was way better than the second. But like any Animaniacs episodes, you're going to have a good one. And you're going to have kind of a less good one. The second episode is definitely a less good one. And I'll get into that with all the, with all the feminism shit. The feminism shit kind of kind of made me think, oh, they're, they're not going to do this too much more because it's just not that funny. But they're going with their little message and their little shit. So... If more of the series is like the first episode, I think we're going to be gold because it was really, really funny. I, I took some notes. I did take some notes. Now, they, they, had, they, took, they took a stab at the female CEO that's now in charge of like the Warner studio where, where Dot's like, hey, any help for, uh, do you want to mentor any up and coming female executives? And she's like, no, I'm the type of female who's going to pull the ladder up behind me. Meow, bitch. Yes, yes, yes. Calling out the fake CEOs who really, really only care about their own stuff and not about feminism in general. That was a joke I really, really liked, and I had to make note of that. That was really funny. So, so there's a lot of great moments, and I don't want to, I don't want to give you guys just a recap of, of joke by joke by joke recap. But I think if you can kind of look at it from the lens of somebody who wrote this two years ago. In the style of something from 20 years ago, I think people are going to really, really like it. So, so that's a lot of what um, episode one is. Oh, <laughs> they, they updated everybody. There, there was a Hillary breaking the glass ceiling joke. And they made a point to say, yeah, and it feels like we're getting glass raining on us all over the place from that glass ceiling there. She's just chipping away at it and she's just raining down the broken glass on them. So they're taking shots at Hillary. They're taking shots at... Uh, they're, they're taking shots of a lot of stuff. And I think it's a little less politicized than the past two years have been. So think of it when a at a time where people were just like, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. There's also this weird upset from people who don't want them to even mention a certain Captain Jack Sparrow actor. Yeah, you know, that guy from 21 Jump Street that I'm not allowed to name names of. People are really, really upset that they even show him in the thing at all in this massive reboot song that they were singing. I can't remember which episode the reboot song was. Oh, it's in episode one still. It's after the Pinky and the Brain stuff. I'll, t I'll talk about the Pinky and the Brain stuff separately. This whole reboot song that really, really pokes fun at and is self-aware about the sellout cash machine of Hollywood and how everything is just garbage now. And they're taking that and they're taking a tongue in cheek. Yeah, we know we're selling out, but we're still going to do it anyway because we're better than the, than everybody else who's doing it. And we're funnier and we're cl more clever. We're more witty. For the most part. For the most part. And for the most part, they are. They didn't miss a beat in the first episode at all. There was nothing really that pissed me off. There was nothing that kind of took me out of it and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I'm watching it through critics' eyes. I'm watching it looking for something that might possibly trigger 
my very more, my much more, well, they're not left, like, they're not all left. My audience is not all left. I understand that. And I kind of like to think that my audience is more centrist, normal, realistic, people who don't want just labels. You know, they want substance beyond a label. And if that constitutes being right wing nowadays, then, well, you know what I say about left and right wing? They're both attached to the same fucking dead parrot. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. This is an ex parrot. <laughs> This stuff is kind of where that mindset comes in, where left or right wing, you're both still attached to the same dead parrot and we're gonna poke fun at you. That is what I really, really liked about this. And, and I don't think it's going to really, really piss off or annoy anybody depending on their political leanings for the most part, for the most part. Even though it was written in 2018, like I said, they take shots at, in the Piggy in the Brain episode, they take a lot of shots at the unfunny late night comics. Oh, I gotta talk about the Piggy in the Brain episode before we, we wrap the first episode review and I get into the second one, because the second one's where we're gonna have some issues, right? The second one will be some, some things. And I'm gonna give you the score based on the first two alone, because the first one was a lot higher than the second one for me. The Pinky and the Brain segment of the first episode picks up exactly where we left off. They redid the opening, it looked like. They modernized it a bit. It's still the same song, though, and it's still Pinky and the Brain. It is still perfect and funny. Brain develops this device uh, over 20 years. He's basically making a cell phone for Pinky because Pinky wants to watch TV on the go because he likes the dumbest pets and he likes those funny videos. So Brain develops a way to control everybody through their cell phone with cute brain videos, cute animal videos, and he ends up getting himself put on with Late Night with Seth Meyers, and Seth Meyers comes out and makes an orange man bad joke, and they make a point to zoom in on him where he's smiling. He's like, I'll wait until you guys get it. They didn't add the crickets. It would have been funnier if they did. Call me. I'm available for a writing gig on Animaniacs. And they make a point to point out how unfunny the late night comics are with their fucking orange man bad jokes constantly over and over and over. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I'm a huge Pinky and the Brain fan anyway. They were kind of, I like them probably more than Animaniacs because Pinky's so cute! Pinky's so cute! Anywho, I really, I really enjoyed that part. Um, and then the reboot song was like the tail end of episode one. I didn't find a problem with it. I wasn't offended. And the fact that people are just upset that they merely mention John, you know, you know, the guy, the guy whose wife took a shit in his bed, that guy. But I don't know why they're so upset. I guess they just want to remove him from society now because re and wan reasons. <laughs> don't you start SJWs. All right. Now, episode two, <laughs> episode two. Well, and I did, I did write some notes down. It's poking fun at itself and everyone like it always has, like it always has has and there's going to be some little eye rolling instances of okay dots a little bit over the top feminist now that is where we're gonna have the biggest issues and that's episode two so episode two episode two they're basically greek gods they're smiting people there's oh can we get carpal tunnel from smiting people they go on vacation they end up uh running across odysseus and they try and throw and, and punish him. They send him to Hades. He thinks it's an American Ninja Warrior. He treats it like an obstacle course. It's really actually pretty funny. This is where the, the Trump as Cyclops joke comes in, right? This is where that comes in. Now, this is where some people who are super duper 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 diehard Orange Man fans are going to be a little bit offended by that just because even though I thought it was pretty funny, I thought it was kind of funny how they did it because he's like, and this is my island, and it's the bestest island ever. And it was actually funny. It was the funniest Orange Man bad stuff I've ever seen because it wasn't really poking fun at policies or any of that stuff. It was just kind of exaggerating his personality in a comedic way that really, really didn't make it super partisan or political. This is the same type of joke that they could have probably made 20 years ago about him, right? They could have made the same joke about him when he was just a reality star. They could have made that exact same joke about him anywhere. <laughs> and I, I thought that was pretty funny. I actually, I actually didn't mind that. And I was looking and trying to pay attention because I know a lot of my audience does lean more, lean more towards the orange man. And that's fine if you do. I'm not going to re or criticize you for it. That's your choice, right? The only stuff I really have a problem with is when people kind of do the antagonistic stuff or the, I'm holier than thou because my choice is better than yours or morally superior. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Maybe, like I said, left and right wing. 
both attached to the same dead parrot and it's starting to smell. So maybe we can do something about that. I didn't mind that joke so much. The pinky in the brain stuff. It was a little weaker of a pinky in the brain episode for the second one. They're in medieval times. There's a lot of kind of callbacks to Monty Python inspired stuff, which as somebody like me, who is a huge Monty Python fan, I really, really appreciated it. Now I can't remember the episode that I just watched, but I was reminded of Monty Python. And of course, they're like, and you're going to be our third mouse and we're going to rule the world together. And then somebody takes him and uses him as a mouse kebab because they're eating them. That Oh, it's funny. It's funny. It was a good, it was actually really funny. It was good. There's a lot of good sight gags in, in this episode too. There's a lot of really good sight gags in the Pinky and the Brain second episode. The whole plot of that one is they want to take over the kingdom by slaying a dragon. They find a dragon and spoiler. Yeah, full spoilers, by the way. I don't want to spoil every single joke, but the dragon is this giant drama, drama queen sort of guy. So they end up putting on a play to convince the king that they are slaying the dragon and fun and tales or whatever happens there. I liked that one. It was not as funny as the first Pinky in the Brain one, but yeah, what, what what can you do? Not everyone's going to be a 10 out of 10. The thing that really, really pissed me off, the last little segment of episode two was Dot's song about the suffragettes wanting to vote. And they, it's like they didn't know where to go with it. It's like they wanted to make a feminist statement. They wanted to make this feminist statement without having a fucking joke there. So they had to find any way. They, this reminds me of something that I would have written just in my sleep when I was 12 years old thinking that I need to get back and, and, and do something because feminism or whatever. It was so juvenile. It was so not funny and it went on so long so so dot basically figures that hey it's a it's the 100th anniversary of the women's suffragette movement so i'm gonna make a song about it and she brings up you know all the the famous all the greatest hit players of the whole movement and then she realizes hey cartoons don't have a right to vote so we're gonna make a whole song about getting cartoons the right to vote <sighs> Just skip that one. It's not funny. It's not worth it. It's not cute. It's not interesting. It's, it just went on too long and it wasn't very funny. It was kind of cute to see all these callbacks and to see how they could int intertwine and weave in all these references of like speed buggy and the Flintstones and all this stuff into this song. It's a skipper though. It's something like if I were watching the DVDs of this, I will never watch that little segment again. But luckily the rest of the show holds up pretty well. Now, now, that's just the first two episodes. That's the first two. And I saw somebody in chat say they had too many uh, Russian bot and Trump jokes. They did. They did They did have a few too many Russian bot sort of jokes there or, or just, just sort of things like that. But, but I think they kind of worked pretty well in the context of where they put them and they weren't in every single thing and it's not going to be every single episode. Hopefully, hopefully so far. I don't know. I didn't watch the whole thing. So this is just the review of the first two episodes. And out of the six segments I watched, including the intro, one of them was really not worth watching at all. If the entire show was just that, I would say skip it and pass. If it was all just Dot Warner and the suffragette feminist, blah, 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 yada, yada. It's not like we didn't already have stuff like that anyway. It's not like we didn't already have those sort of segments back then anyway. I don't know why they need to come in and beat the dead horse. I don't know why they need to drag it up and, and, and what? I mean, it's already dead. We've already done it. We've already been there. But hey. I did enjoy this for the most part, except for that little tail end where I was just kind of like, eh, it's getting a little long. It's getting long. I would have much rather seen like a Good Feathers or a Katie Kaboom or Slappy Squirrel or anything. Now, with that being said, with that being said, they can't do Hello Nurse anymore. We've already talked a little bit about how they can't do Hello Nurse anymore. And you know what? I'll bring it in too because I think it's kind of relevant. Is this show worth worth a Hulu subscription? Hmm. I would almost say, well, what, what's a Hulu subscription? Like less than 10 bucks, you can marathon it all in one day, do the, do the thing, or wait until the Orville comes out and then watch it. I am really, really enjoying it. If you are a huge diehard Animaniacs fan and can, like me, and can get past the one or two kind of stinkers for the mostly good stuff, I would almost say, yeah, it's worth it. And I don't like paying for anything. That's another thing. They're not doing all of the characters. 
But then again, some of the characters and some of those those jokes and skits kind of got a little old anyway, like Runt and Rita. How many people skip past Runt and Rita in the day? Or even Good Feathers? Or even Katie Kaboom? Or Chicken Boo? Or any of the others? I skipped past a lot of that, and the Animaniacs were always the main funny thing. The Animaniacs themselves, the Warners, and Pinky and the Brain were always my go-to favorites anyway of the whole thing. And then when Freakazoid came out, I'm like, oh, you screw you guys, I'm going to Freakazoid, because that's where it's at. That's the funny one. Can we get a Freakazoid reboot? Will it be as good as the Animaniacs reboot? If it's anywhere near as good as this, then I would say yes, absolutely, give me a Freakazoid reboot now, yesterday. Please, please do, because I would absolutely love that. I really enjoyed this. I'd have to give the first episode a nine and a half out of 10. The second episode, probably a seven out of 10. And we'll have to average that somewhere around in the eights out of 10 sort of thing. Yeah, nine and a half out of 10 for the first episode. That's not bad at all. There, there was not, and I was looking for stuff to complain about in the first episode. I was looking for something. How am I going to go in and find something to critique on a show I love? And that is always my biggest challenge as a critic, and that's why I don't do a lot of positive reviews. And knowing that it's a show I already like going into, it's a show that I already kind of know behind the scenes where their intentions are. Can I live without Hello Nurse? I mean, I've got Hello Nurse on my DVD anyway. Where are they going to put her? I mean, she only really works when you've got her next to Otto Von Scratch and Sniff. And... There's really not a whole lot of need for them to be psycho-evaluated by Otto Von Scratch and Sniff right now, especially with new studio heads and new executives 20 years later. I mean, well, that's the thing with Hello Nurse, though, is like, how much, how much of that could you really keep doing anyway? I think that would be my big question is, how much can they bring back of Hello Nurse anyway without just repeating the same joke? How much can they bring back of any of this stuff without just repeating the same joke? How much of this is going to be, okay, now we've seen all of this, do we really need any more of this? I think people might overreact a little bit to this because I'm not really missing Hello Nurse in the first two episodes anyway. Would I have rather had anything other than that Suffragette song from the second episode? Yeah. Yeah, I would have rather had like a Buttons and Mindy or Katie Kaboom or... Rita and Runt or Good Feathers or something. I would have rather had something other than another Dot song. But a lot of the time, the Dot songs aren't that great anyway. I mean, the I'm Cute song wasn't very good, so. Eh, nine and a half out of ten for the first episode. What did I say about a seven out of ten for the second? That's just because of that Suffragette song knocked it down. Or was it a six? I can't even remember anymore. I want to keep watching it. I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. I liked what I saw for the first two episodes. I don't think this is really, really going to be a huge issue. If you didn't know Hello Nurse wasn't in it, you probably wouldn't even notice. I am going back to my live chat. Don't you guys go anywhere. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, make sure to hit that like button. And if you want to see more, don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye.